We're seven o'clock. I am recording. Um, basically, right now we have about a hundred participants total. Um, we have live with us uh, some of our panelists, and the, then we have also, in addition to the panelists, uh, we have two interviews. Um, let's see. Starting from the left at the minute, at least on my computer, we have um, Christopher Carson. And uh, he's the gentleman in black and white, a novel approach, I might add, to everybody else. But that's Chris. He's very novel. And then next to him uh, is, uh, and, is uh, Fred Becker. And uh, Fred is, of course, uh, associated with the National Space Society. By the way, Fred really is instrumental in helping set this all up. Uh, he's also helping me to pop the recordings over. Uh, into um, YouTube so that that'll be up there for posterity and for any people that uh, would like to watch it again or um, so forth. Let's see, then we have uh, next to him, we have Mark Lucas and his wife, uh, Karen. And Mark and Karen are, are from the uh, Yuri's Night and they're going to be uh, talking a bit about that whole affair that has a special um, presentation later today. Next to them is Janet Ivey, and Ivy Janet is with uh, the National Space Society, and she's also has a, a channel uh, called uh, Janet's Planet, um, or URL, and, and, I'm, and she's going to talk a bit about uh, Space Exploration Day and what that is and when it's happening. Uh, next to Janet is Anita Gale. Anita is also from the National Space Society. She's on the board of directors and she's going to give us a little bit of a shuttle mission history. Um, the other two people that are taped and will be, um, I'll be playing their taped interviews. Uh, the first one we almost all must know of, and that is Captain Jim Lovell, uh, Apollo 13 commander. He also was on Apollo 8. And um, he's going to be talking about both of those uh, adventures. And finally, uh, William Johnson. William Johnson happens to be a personal friend. Didn't know about the fact that he also was uh, instrumental in building the Hubble Space Telescope. He literally was the manager um, for um, Lockheed Martin. And that was his job, was managing the construction of the Hubble Telescope. And that'll be a very interesting uh, um, bit of history. Both of these two gentlemen, um, uh, Captain Lovell and uh, Mr. Johnson, are in their 90s. So that'll be, we're lucky to have caught them and heard from them and hopefully uh, gotten these words for posterity. So um, the first thing we're going to do here, we're going to play the uh, Captain Lovell interview. Hello. Hey, Captain Lovell, right? That's right. Yeah. My name is Joseph Bland. Good to meet you, sir. Hi, Joe. Well, this is my living room. So, and I'm in my study. And you're in your study. Well, this is really great. Are you comfortable there? Oh, I, I spend a lot of time here now, uh, you know, based on the fact that we're all tied in. Yes, we are. And indeed, my wife and I have been uh self-sheltering or whatever the term is for almost a month now uh that became policy in california well it's policy here in illinois too <laughs> well i turned my iphone um, around and lengthwise instead of up and down and that oh, works does that help you that absolutely helps um i'm here in sacramento with my beautiful wife she's upstairs still asleep lucky her um, of 35 years now. And well, we're, uh, we're at 68 years. How many? 68. Oh, 68. Well, that's just, I'm only 74, so <laughs> that's, that kind of tells that tale. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're talking to uh, some guy who's just turned 92, so <laughs> here oh, I am. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. We've been trying to do all of the manned Apollo flights. Uh, we missed the first uh, couple. And in fact, one of the really neat things is you're in one of the ones we missed. You were up in Apollo 8. And uh, so 
in addition to talking a little bit about uh, Apollo 13 and for our, for our celebration, obviously, it, it would be great if you could talk a little bit about Apollo 8 as well. Well, I'd be more than happy to. Apollo 8, of course, was a very instrumental flight. I mean, that, uh, the first flight to the moon, of course, I think is uh, uh, the first time people saw the far side of the moon. I looked at it as a Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, and I guess I was a little bit different than Frank Borman or Bill Anders. Uh, I know Frank just looked at it beating the rushes to the moon, uh, which is, I guess, you know, nice to do. But more than that, it was a time for us to see the far side of the moon, to orbit only 60 miles above its surface and look at its old ancient craters and, uh, and, and look at the topography of it. Uh, and then look at, at the Earth, seeing the Earth from 240,000 miles away, uh, knowing that that's your homeland, that that's your, uh, your house, <laughs> that's where you live, and you can put your thumb up to the window and completely hide it. Incredible. Um, you were the first person to see the far side of the moon. That was really, a, you know, a first emotional thing. And we, by the way, Unlike, say, uh, Apollo uh, hmm. 10 or 11, okay. they have specific jobs to do. They're more concentrated on the moon. We, uh, we had time to think about ourselves. When I, when I looked at the moon and I could hide it with my thumb, you know, I, I had that uh, feeling of, well, how do I belong here? What do I do? And, and then I realized, I realized that I was very, very fortunate because I, I arrived on that planet uh, that had the, enough gravity to support uh, 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 water and an atmosphere, the very essentials for life. And, and I applied and I uh, you know, arrived on this planet, happened to be orbiting in a star just to the right uh, distance, not too far out to be too cold or in too close to be too hot just to the right distance to absorb that star's energy. And energy that caused, of course, life to begin here on Earth. Amazing, and you, that insight just hit you as you looked at the Earth there in the distance. Well, yeah, that's true. And to me, the answer was clear, that uh, God has given us a, a platform upon which to uh, perform. Uh, how the play turns out, of course, up to us. <laughs> and then when you saw the moon closer and closer, that in itself must have been a thrilling, thrilling moment for you. That must have been something. And then, of course, you had a fair, I'm assuming that was a fairly yeah. uneventful uh, flight. We were, we were very fortunate, by the way, it was a very good flight. The command module worked perfectly. Navigation turned out to be the way to be. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it was the right choice to make. It was a very, you know, uh, uh, difficult choice to make. I mean, you know, stressful. Uh, because if we had a problem on Apollo 8, that would probably have been the end of the entire space program. You know, and, and not thinking about uh, trying to land on the moon on Apollo 11 or well, it anything. It certainly would have uh, set it back, would have set it back quite a bit. Yeah, you're right. It would set it back. And uh, then, of course, uh, you have the contrast with the other uh, trip that you personally made around the moon, which was, in fact, a life or death struggle uh, that you survived or you wouldn't be talking to me today. Um, it's classic, of course, Every, films have been made about it, all the rest, um, but you lived it. And uh, so if you start from the beginning of Apollo 13 um, and you're sitting on the ground, you've already done the blast off with the Apollo 8, so you know what's coming from that point of view. When did you start feeling like, oh, this is something's not quite the same? Because you had something to kind of compare it to. Well, you have to look at Apollo 13 a little bit differently. Okay. It, it, it was uh, uh, an unusual flight. For instance, the, 
why we named uh, the spacecraft 13 is something I'm beginning to wonder these days. I'm not superstitious, but there is a certain amount of, of uh, superstitious uh, attitude towards that number. And, and when I look back on it now, you have to look at some of the things that happened. Uh, first of all, in training for the, the flight, suddenly we uh, found out that the crew was exposed to the measles. Unusual. Yeah. And then we had to replace one of the crew members uh, with another one. And, uh, and, and so that was the beginning of the thing. Then, then when you look at, at, uh, uh, at, at during the training of the flight, during the final phases of, towards the mission, uh, the, and the spacecraft already on the booster out of the launch site. Uh, and we did one last test. It was called uh, the uh, takeoff test anyway, just to make sure everything is ready for the takeoff. Uh, uh, before, about, uh, oh, I'd say a year before or something like that, uh, the factory that was building the liquid oxygen tank dropped it on the factory floor. They, uh, of course, they picked it up and and uh, and checked it out for everything that it had to do, which was essentially take the uh, liquid oxygen into gaseous oxygen and then send it to the uh, to the uh, the fuel cell that would uh, take the oxygen and hydrogen, convert it to electrical power and water. This is how it all worked. Well, that worked perfectly, but there was a second function to that tank that they didn't check. And that was the ability to remove the liquid oxygen after a routine check. Uh, the dual device, which was mostly a piece of hose in there, uh, was supposed to be able to do that. They didn't check it. And then on the test itself, just two weeks before the flight, and we did this uh, countdown demonstration test, uh, filled up the uh, spacecraft with consumables, the liquid oxygen, of course. And after the flight was over, or the test was over, uh, ground crew went to replace, to remove the uh, liquid oxygen, and they found out on this one tank that uh, that was dropped on the factory floor, they couldn't do it. We couldn't get it out. And they could not get it out. Oh my God! So they were in a quandary, uh, and this is just two weeks before the flight. But then they remembered that at the launch site, there was availability uh, a 65 volt power system. Now the spacecraft flew at a 28 volt power system. Okay. But back in 1965, years before, NASA had asked the manufacturer of that tank to replace the thermostats, uh, 28 volt capacity to 65 volt capacity so that they could use that, uh, that, ex that uh, 65 volt external power system if they had to. Got it. And on 13, there was a case where they had to. Okay. So the maker of the lunar module system unfortunately neglected to follow through on the directive, and the 28 volt thermostats were never replaced. And um, two weeks before the launch, we applied 65 volt power to remove the liquid oxygen just to boil it out. We were going to turn on the, uh, the little uh, uh, heating system in the tank uh -huh. and, uh, to, to change the liquid to a gas. That's how we do it uh, in sure. flight. And, uh, and so that's what happened. Only the 65 volt power was applied. And as the temperature rose in the tank, and it was sort of removing all the liquid, of course, but uh, the, and when it reached 80 degrees, the little thermostats uh, the 28 volt thermostat started to open up, but the higher power, 65 volt, welded them shut. And after that, there was no uh, safety factor. And we know now the temperature got up to six or 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my like gosh. That, and quickly removed all the liquid oxygen. For some reason, did not talk, uh, cause the, the tank to, to explode at high pressure. And nothing was ever known. The, 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 the damage was not uh, looked at, or the, they didn't think there was any damage. And of course, what it did was it took the uh, it took the covering off the wires inside the tank, exposed them, metal, metal, to bare metal, but nothing happened.
and it looked like everything was fine. They, they removed the liquid oxygen and they secured the, the spacecraft. And then the day before launch, they filled up the tank again with liquid oxygen. And then it was a bomb waiting to go off. Waiting to go off. Wow. That is an amazing story. That is an amazing yeah. story. And of course you didn't know, nobody knew. Now there was an incident while you were launching, but it had nothing to do with this bomb thing, correct? Oh yes, well, yes there was. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, 13 has a lot of bad omens attached to it. And we launched on April 11th at 13.13 Central Standard oh, Time. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Okay, and we took off and uh, we went around the earth as normal and then we let the second stage of our uh, of, of booster to get uh, the proper velocity to even coast all the way to the moon. Right. And about two minutes before it should have, the center engine of the second stage suddenly shut down. Okay. And we were, this was our, our first real concern. We didn't know about the, the tank situation, of course. Uh, we thought everything was fine. Uh, and uh, then we wondered, do we have enough uh, uh, velocity uh, to keep going? Um, and w just what the story was. Right. Well, it turned out the story to make it possible to go to the moon was the fact that we used the third stage of our vehicle to get us around the Earth first and then with enough propellant left uh, to get up to the velocity to go on a long elliptical orbit all the way to the moon. So there we thought, hey, we had a problem with losing that engine, but we had enough fuel, enough uh, thrust in our other engines to continue the mission to head all the way to the moon. We thought everything is finally taken care of. Uh, our bad problems of 13 are behind us. Uh, we're on our way to the moon. So, okay, so really it wasn't, you were all fine, everything was copacetic, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, well, uh, we were almost, well, we were just about 200,000 miles from Earth. Uh, Fred Hayes and I were in the lunar module. Our job was to conduct a, uh, a look-see uh, for uh, a program uh, that was being sent down to Mission Control. Mission Control, of course, sent it to the three networks. No one carried it, yeah. naturally, and uh, we didn't know it at the time. And we had just finished, and I was in the process of going down back into the command module through that tunnel, when suddenly the explosion occurred. It, a big bang, and the spacecraft sort of rocked back and forth. And I, uh, I then looked up at Fred Hayes, who was still in the lunar module, and uh, I could tell from his expression he had absolutely no idea. And then I, as I was climbing down into the command module, I looked at Jack Swigert. And his eyes were as white as saucers. He didn't have any idea. Uh, and and it was Jack, of course, that heard the explosion. And he said, uh, Houston, we have a problem here. He didn't know what the problem was, but that's where that uh, expression first uh, started. Right. That's right. And um, so then the rest of the, there, there are, of course, movies done of that whole event and everything like that and how you managed to get and solve the problem. Um, and I also, I believe, as I recall, they were actually somehow stirring up the oxygen in the tank. There's some kind of paddles or something in it that they were stirring it. And a, Well, what happened was, just as we finished the TV program, uh, Mission Control called to Jack and said, Jack, now's the time to stir the tanks. That means there's a little fan system in the liquid oxygen tanks because the, the liquid oxygen was almost a, a very, uh, uh, it was not just liquid. It was not just ice. It was in that in-between you know, sloppy period. Slush. And we, <laughs> yes, yeah, and we had to slug it. Then we had to stir it up. And then what we would do after we stirred it up and with the, the system still on, we would then uh, uh, heat, turn on the heater in the tank and that would convert some of the liquid to gas. That gas then was forced into the fuel cells 
uh, in the spacecraft, of course, and uh, we had converted that plus a hydrogen to electrical power. Correct. And we, we did that, you know, all the flights did that off and on during the flights. A very normal procedure. Well, what happened was when Jack turned the switch on, uh, there was a short because the wires were bare now. They, they had no protection. And that short then, I'm sure, it caused a, a, a quick fire and then a quickly expansion of gas from liquid that blew the side of the tank off, which then blew the side of the spacecraft off. And I think that was the explosion which we heard uh, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, just as we finished the program. You know, maybe it's a lucky 13 because... Uh, you're right. We were very, very lucky. People don't ever realize that. But if that tank had exploded just after we committed ourselves to go to the moon at high velocity, the lunar module at that period would never have had enough consumables to get us all the way around the moon and get back home again because there was no way to quickly turn around and go back to the Earth because we had damaged the uh, the big rocket engine on the on the command module uh, that uh, because it needed electricity and we were running out of electricity. Got it. If, it, if that explosion had waited until we were in lunar orbit, or heaven forbid, on the lunar surface, then uh, you would be talking to somebody who was still a resident of the moon. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> the first resident, permanent resident of the moon. Actually, we would be the permanent residents of the moon. <laughs> It was a close, close thing, and so um, it was. Whether it was, a, you know, a, a, a directive from above that gave us that made the explosion at that time, uh, but whatever it was, uh, if, if you're spiritual, that's exactly the time that the God helped save us, and uh, otherwise, we'd, you know, we'd be in deep trouble. Well, as the saying goes, uh, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> And uh, that might well be a perfect example of that, which is not a bad example for today, uh, actually, in our present crisis. We didn't quite have that feeling. We weren't just going to get in a sort of a fetal position waiting for a miracle to happen. Uh, it, God helps them who helps themselves. That's right. And you did. And it was, a, it was miraculous. It does, though, kind of make the point about 50 years ago, my goodness, 50 years ago, and where we were technologically, what we were able to accomplish 50 years before that time, where we were technologically speaking. Maybe Henry Ford had you know, done his assembly, but it wasn't much beyond that. But here you were literally going around the moon, the technological incredibleness of that, uh, and, and what that says about the human spirit. Well, that's true. I mean, uh, uh, here we had a, a problem, and uh, we didn't know what happened right away. Of course, uh, we, we knew that we were going to land on the moon because as soon as I got down into the space, into the uh, command module, I saw that the, uh, the, the fuel cells had been, uh, two of the, out of the three had been uh, shut down. And... Uh, Although one fuel cell would have given us electrical power just to get around the moon and get home again. So I, I really wasn't disturbed in that nature. I was very disappointed saying, you know, this is going to ruin our landing, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so as time went on and I started to, uh, with my eyes, search the instrument panel to see exactly what happened, I thought I, I ought to look out the window and see if the explosion it, it, you know, it, if, I, if there's something out there, and why today I, I did that, I don't know. Uh, and, but I did, I went out to the, looked at the, outside the left window, and that's when I saw escaping at a high rate of speed, a gaseous substance. Uh, then, it, then everything began to dawn on me, because as I saw that, and as I looked around on the instrument panel, I suddenly saw one of the uh, instruments uh, was zero of uh, the oxygen tank, one of the, and the other one, the needle was going down. 
realizing that, uh, that we were going to shortly lose all of our oxygen, which meant that we would lose the ability to have electrical power in the command module, which we would be relying on the battery in the command module and what we had in the lunar module. Uh, that was all we had uh, from then on. That sort of that sort of decided it right then and there. You weren't going to the lunar surface. You're going home. That's right. And then, of course, very fortunately, we had a nice mission control team, and we got together with them, and we all came to that same conclusion that uh, this was the case where we'd have to use the lunar module as a lifeboat to get home. Now, it had been thought about uh, for, I guess, several years before, um, you know, Apollo of, of using the lunar module in some capacity if we had a problem. I don't think it was every, never fully thought out. I, uh, in training uh, for Apollo 13 flight, we didn't use the lunar module system as, as, as a temporary, you know, problem we had until right. the, the actual case came up. So I've just lost video, unfortunately, with you. Um, it froze up. This happens upon occasion. We are literally talking across the country. Anyway, um, sir, it's, it's really been wonderful talking to you. Um, I can't think of a better possible way to celebrate Apollo 13. But what a wonderful honor to have had this opportunity to speak with you. Um, thank you for supporting the National Space Society. Thank you for all that you've done and the service you've given. Uh, th I also thanks to everybody that helped you to get there both times and back. Thanks to all the people that, that got us to the moon. There's so many people you would want to thank and we're talking myriads now. Um, well, you're right. Uh, Apollo 13 was a perfect example that uh, good leadership and, uh, you know, uh, good uh, uh, thinking uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, would, would you know, put together, uh, you know, would make an almost certain catastrophe into a successful recovery. Mission Control was a you know, great success. They, they, they took that problem and they, they finally, you know, did something. Of course, one of the greatest things was they uh, tried to remove the carbon dioxide because uh, the lunar module had, it failed uh, because it was supposed to support only two people and there were three people and it was only support for two days and it was four days and consequently how we use the command module uh, lithium hydroxide canisters in the lunar module system was one that mission control uh, and their crew systems division had done a wonderful job the square peg and the round hole <laughs> yeah, that's how yeah, i that's think true. of it that's true well, anyway, thank you so much for this wonderful phone call. Please thank your wife. Thank, uh, uh, I also thank uh, the people that got me in touch with you. Um, and the, the NSS is uh, very, very fortunate to have you uh, on their side. And so are we, the United States and the world indeed. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful interview. So is my wife and so is that mountain that's named for her, Mount Maryland. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Thanks, and you have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye now.